Thank you so much, Max. Hi, Hugo. How's it going? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> How are you? Very, very good. So, uh, Hugo, uh, uh, friend of the Foundry, it's great to see you uh, in a new capacity. So, very familiar with the stuff you've been doing with us, traveling the world and people who are in India or through Eastern Europe or Portugal or Spain may have seen Hugo do talks on uh, how he's been putting together commercials for using Foundry products. Um, so it's interesting to see you here in slightly a new capacity. Tell us a bit about what you're doing. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much for this opportunity, guys. It's always a pleasure to come here and talk with you guys and make some uh, showcase some stuff. Um, and yeah, so that's true. I've, uh, I've kind of changed my workflow and changed the way I worked. Uh, I left the mill last year and uh, I've been working uh, as a visual effects supervisor and as a creative director for uh, a lot of clients. Uh, but um, so if you guys want to check out what I've been up to, you can go and visit my website uh, at Hugo, uh, Hugo guerre.com. Uh, you can check what I've been doing in regards uh, short films and some game cinematics. But, but what I'm presenting here today is the work that I'm doing at Fire Without Smoke. So. Uh, lately, I've been working a lot with them um, on specific uh, game cinematics. So that's been my my main work uh, for Fire Without Smoke. Cool. Tell us a bit about the company. So yeah, so Fire Without Smoke is a company based in London. Um, it's operating, been operating for almost two years now, um, and <coughs> they are specialized in game marketing, uh, game marketing and products for game uh, games like trailers, gameplay trailers, cinematic trailers, websites, covers, everything that has to do with games. Um, and it's, it's, you know, uh, it's kind of quite a quite an interesting company. I really enjoy working with them because they, you know, it's a it's a game company that works with gamers, you know, the people that that created the company, they are gamers themselves, we all play games, so we understand the products. And so I've been having a lot of uh, fun working with them lately. Very cool. And so uh, what sort of, you worked on a couple of projects recently, what things yeah. have you been working on? So today I bring you two game cinematics. The first one I bring is for Just Cause 3. Uh, so this is a game from Square Enix uh, that it will be released for the end of this year. And Fire Without Smoke has been very involved on making uh, the game play, uh, gameplay trailers, been making this trailer that I'm showing today, which is called Firestarter. Uh, we've also been involved on doing the covers and a lot of the marketing uh, products for the game. Um, so yeah, so let, let me show you the trailer first, sure. and, and then you can, can, can we can continue the discussion. Nice. Uh, so it's obviously so it's uh, you know it's a, it's a trailer for a game, uh, yeah. but it looks highly cinematic. You know, it could be a, a, a title sequence for a Bond film or something like that. 
Um, and you're kind of used to doing those things. I know you've worked in short films before. What what are some of the similarities between making a, you know a, a game trailer and then doing something like a commercial or a short film? Yeah. Well, I I guess it's it's a very different approach, really, because you know in a commercial you are much more focused on the product. You're much more focused on selling that specific product. You have a lot of people uh, involved on the project from the brand, you know, from the actual company that is selling the product. Then you have art direction from agencies. You have uh, an entire campaign of publicity involved on the project, as opposed to a game which has a much more cinematic storytelling side. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a story of the game, the game has a specific plot or a specific game device, and you are trying to showcase that. You're trying to introduce the people to the atmosphere of the game and to the world of the game. Mm -hmm. That's what happened here with Just Cause. Like we, we worked very closely with Square Enix um, at Fire Without Smoke and, and really wanted to try to create what if we were inside the head of Rico. You know, Rico is the main character of Just mm -hmm. Cause. Uh, it's the third game. It's a very <coughs> successful franchise. And he's, you know, he's a sucker for chaos and destruction. So we, wa we thought like, okay, what if we are inside his head? What would we see? And that's what we've come up with. So most of the scenes that you see on the trailer have co complete connections to the game, mm -hmm. to certain uh, levels and certain missions that you play on the game, um, you know, without, uh, of course, telling uh, a lot because the game is not out yet, but it does have a lot of connections. And once people play the game, they will understand a lot of the mm. things that we've introduced on this trailer, really. So you're trying to get across a story. You're also trying to get, a, get across a feeling, as, you know, and using cinematic language to do that, I guess. So briefly, what, what's, the plot of the, what's the plot of the game? What's well, it about? the game is about uh, Rico. Uh, the game is an open world game, so it's a very free game. You can do really whatever you like, but of course, there's a lot of missions and side missions. But it's all about the story of Rico trying to rescue this gigantic open world island that is run by a dictator uh, regime. You know, so the, he's bringing down the regime. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you a lot of the other plot devices because it's all very secret, and the game is not out until Christmas. But that's pretty much like the thing. You so, know, like, like the statue coming down and all that stuff refers to. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. It refers to gameplay uh, devices. Cool. And I mean, r recently, Fire Without Smoke produced a gameplay a gameplay trailer, which has actual game uh, game footage in. Um, captured by the game itself, by the game engine. And there you see the statue, you see also him jumping off a cliff with a car and then using the car as a weapon. You know, like there's all those crazy things that we actually introduced for the first time on this uh, CG trailer. And now it's been introduced again on the actual gameplay trailer. So it's all part of a campaign to introduce people to the world of Just Cause. Okay. Cool. So now, and you also did another one. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a little bit different yeah. in the sense of the type yeah. of game and so on. Yeah, uh, yeah so, so the second one that I brought here today for you guys is called Rival Kingdoms. Um, it's a CG trailer for the launch of Rival Kingdoms. Rival Kingdoms is a game created by a London company uh, as well uh, called Space Ape. And uh, it was just released a few weeks ago, a very, very successful uh, iOS game uh, right now available on Android as well. And they've already down, they, there's already more than one million downloads on it, so it's really, really successful. Wow. <laughs> and the game is doing really well. So on this one, it was a bit different. It was almost like a commercial, because we were supposed to show, of course, introducing people to the world of the game. But um, we wanted to, um, you know, it was a bit more cinematic. L let's watch the trailer, I'll talk about it after.
Yeah. So this is a very different trailer. So this one pretty much is an introduction to the universe. We're introducing the ancients, which are these god-looking beings that you can summon on the game. You know, it's a strategy game, so you can summon these gigantic beings that have a lot of magical powers <coughs> that can actually destroy your adversaries. So it was all about that. It was all about showcasing these m gigantic beings and actually showcasing some of the gameplay. Um, and so it's, it's a much more straightforward trailer, but it introduces a much more cinematic feeling with the beginning, with the statues coming to life and mm -hmm. her walking and touching them, uh, as opposed to the stylized uh, yeah. trailer that you saw for Just Cause. So two different products, really. Cool. And so, so cinematic feel. I guess you're using some of the same tools that you use in a, you know, in a in a film, a short film, or a commercial. What was your what was your setup in doing these? Well, um, I mean, um, on this project, you know, I've I've left. Ever since I left uh, the mill, I've been trying to look for other ways of uh, working, you know, uh, specifically uh, trying to work uh, more remotely and working a bit more connected to my actual, um, you know, lifestyle. And because, you know, I have a very, um, I'm always traveling, I'm always doing quite a lot of uh, presentations with the Foundry, I'm always teaching a lot in Sweden, uh, teaching a lot on the National Television School at Scape Studios. So there was kind of a way that I had to s figure out how can I continue doing these projects, mm. but still um, do these AAA projects, but be mobile. So I kind of figured that cloud would be the future. I still think cloud services and cloud rendering and cloud servers are actually the future of this kind of industry. Of course, we're still not there yet, but a lot of companies are trying their best. Um, it was a major topic this year at FMX. There was a lot of discussions yep. about this. Um, and so, you know, because I've been traveling, I kind of worked out this kind of pipeline that I take on my suitcase. So I usually tend to bring my Mac Pro with the right system. And it kind of fits inside like a little uh, suitcase that you can uh, take with you on the plane. Uh, and that really gave me a lot of freedom because I could actually go directly to my clients. So if mm -hmm. I needed, I could go to their office and show them the project uh, using Nook Studio or the timeline. Uh, I could also, inside the hotel room, for example, work a bit and actually connect with SDI out to the plasma of the hotel and still continue working oh, right. and doing some <laughs> like grading. Like a whole suite there with the plasma. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, it's quite a funny, like every time I go room to a hotel... Room service, like in a suite, you know. <laughs> <laughs> every time champagne, I go to... <laughs> champagne. <laughs> every time I go to a hotel, the first thing I ask them is like, it's two things. Okay, so what's your internet? Can I have a cable? Because I never want the wireless because I want the fastest internet I can get. And the second thing is always, okay, which room has the biggest screen? <laughs> 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 and I always go in and like, I, and a lot of times I, I go into a room and the screen is not good enough. So I ask them to change. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Until you find one with a Dolby monitor, <laughs> like a Dolby grade one monitor. Oh, bring I know, bring I know. in the champagne. There's champagne in here, people. There's <laughs> champagne in a mug right here. <laughs> I know, I know it sounds, I know it sounds ridiculous, but it is, there is you you'll be surprised how many times you find hotels with amazing plasmas really <laughs> uh, you know <laughs> like uh, whenever i go to teach in sweden in campus i12 i always si i always stay on the same room for example because mm. that room has an amazing panasonic plasma a really mm. top of the, the line plasma and i use it for grading all the time so yeah so you know it became much more mobile and it was all about actually being able to be with my clients and actually move you know, if I wanted to work at Fire Without Smoke's office, I could. <coughs> if I want to go to to present to Square Enix, I can. If I want to uh, uh, work on my school, I can. If I want to work on hotel, I can as well. So, and of course, all of it connected with the cloud server. So, yeah. all all of my files are in the cloud. Of course, encrypted with a lot of protection, but all of them are on the cloud. And all my artists, I can distribute specific folders for them. And all of them are actually working. Uh, to their laptop, but automatically being synchronized to the cloud. So every time I would work, I would get their files immediately, uh, and I can update my timelines with mm. their scripts. And you guys all know that Nuke scripts and and these kind of things are quite tiny, so yep. it's quite easy to move around things. Mm. So, so you, so we got so you, you got pipeline in a box, pipeline in a, in a cloud. What yeah. was in your pipeline in a suitcase? <laughs> what you mean in terms of equipment? What I had there? Yeah. What did you have? What tools well, are you using? Well, at the moment, I have. I, I've. I've kind of went to the trash bin uh, Mac Pro. Uh, it's a really uh, powerful machine and very, very small. Very heavy though. Very small. And of course, then I've been using the Wacom um, uh, monitor as my main monitor when I don't find a monitor when I'm there. And then, of course, I have a RAID system from Call Digit. Uh, and then I have, you know, all the software. I, I usually 
Of course, I have Nook Studio, I have Modo, I have Mari, I have the full production package there. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, I have other applications as well uh, installed on that uh, Mac OS. But I found that the Mac OS would be the best OS for that this kind of workflow because I tend to work a lot with my clients with a lot of quick times and a lot of mm -hmm. weird file formats. And so Linux wasn't really going to cut it. It was okay. going to be difficult for me to work in Linux on this kind of pipeline. So, yeah. Cool. So shall we start having a look at how you actually ended up doing the jobs? Yeah, exactly. So you were on the road <laughs> in a hotel with a beautiful plasma, but yeah. Now yeah, yeah, how yeah. did you actually <laughs> do the stuff? <laughs> yeah, so, so these projects, these projects uh, you know, I, let me put this clear. I wasn't always on an hotel. Mm -hmm. I was everywhere. Like I kind of worked on Fire Without Smoke. I worked at my house, worked at the hotel. I worked wherever I could uh, in my team as well. And the thing is, like, um, I started uh, thinking, you know, I also used to do this at the mill as well. Uh, I started using Nuke Studio as my main hub for the whole thing. You know, I would start cutting my storyboard. I would get a storyboard artist. They would start drawing the, the, the story that we wanted to tell. I would start shopping it up in Nuke Studio. Then I would um, send out to the client, get an approval, change a few things. Then I would bring in uh, and do some animatic shots, you know. And Nuke Studio kind of became like the place where I could have all these shots and all these animatics and all these assets and all these clips that I could bounce ideas with my clients and bounce ideas with Square Enix and with uh, Space Ape to see what they would like and not like. And so in a way, it was a very untraditional way of working because we, we never really locked an edit. And I know it sounds terrible to say this, but we didn't. We never locked the edit because it was such, a, such an organic workflow. You know, we, we were experimenting and because I had total control of the edit, I could trim here, trim there. When we get a new sound mix, because all the music of these two trailers were specifically done for the trailer, we would always change a few things. And, a lot of times we did shots that actually didn't make the cut, you know, it came out. And I think it gave a lot of flexibility to have total control and not work on a way where you have uh, an editor and then you have a 3D artist and then you have a 2D artist and where you just lose a lot of time bouncing all these clips around, you know. I, I, I really believe that it's a lot easier to have everything under the same, same uh, umbrella, uh, so to speak. And, uh, you know, and even further, like, because these are game assets, you know, because all of these are, are um, uh, uh, created with the same tools as visual effects, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, the 3D is still generated on the same applications. We used a lot of the 3D assets to do the animatics. And again, in here, me, myself, I always want to edit my own production. So I was the editor and, and it really gave me the opportunity to jump into the shots and bring in the, the actual assets from the game into Nuke into the Nukes 3D system, place some cameras, change some angles, place some lights as placeholders, bounce it to the client, show yeah. them, even maybe screen, uh, screen record the, the, the screen and they can watch it live. And then, you know, immediately you have an edit and then you can double click on the edit, change the camera again, go back to the edit. You really, you know, you really earn a lot of time and you can keep mm. your crew quite small as yeah, well. Yeah. I think that was a main, main advantage of bringing the assets into Nuke. And, um, you know, and also like as, uh, as myself, as an editor, I, I love to have to control the cameras. You know, I could actually make specific decisions of what lenses I was using, what angles I was using. And then I could, with Nuke's exporting systems, I could export Alembic files and FBXs to my 3D team so that they could take over from there. Mm -hmm. uh, so that became quite flexible. It, it's, I think this is a brilliant part of your workflow this time. Cause oh, thank you, you so much. No, well, <laughs> 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 but it's just because you ended up doing this, the, the whole thing of, you are doing um, the storyboarding you have that there, but then you very quickly jump into actually having <laughs> an animatic with 3D. Yeah. And obviously because it's gaming, you're getting all the assets for free. Sorry, game guys. I know Ooh, they do it. Ooh, that's uh, gonna be tough. But, but, <laughs> you, but, but for you, doing this bit is, is for free in a sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because no. now you can jump in and just start getting kind yeah. of a real animatic with the actual views, with the actual characters through yeah. it, and tell more about the story than you could have done before. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, you know, and I know it's it's, you're probably going to get a lot of heat tomorrow about yeah, saying that the game assets were all free. But <laughs> the thing is, like, it's it's true. And, and we also have to understand that this industry is using the same tools. Everyone is using the same tools. Geometry is geometry. You know, shaders are shaders. I know we use different applications, but it's all kind of the same things. Yeah. And 
I'm I'm really a sucker for op for optimization. I've always been, uh, you know, that's how I ran the, the nuclear department at the mill. That's how I run my company now as well. And if someone has already made it, hey, give it to me and I can adapt it and I mm. can change it and I can improve it or or make it simpler or make it more complicated. I can do whatever I need to it, you know. And because all these games already have the characters, they already have the rigs, they already have the models, why not? You know, it, it makes perfect sense. And it also helps the game trailers to have a full connection to the game, you know, because then you look at the trailer and you look at the game. Oh yeah, that's the statue. Oh, that's the car. Yeah. Oh, that's the building. Yeah. It's actually the same stuff. You're not, you're not, you know, you're doing a major connection and you're getting really involved with the with the with the game team as well, yep. which is really cool. So, cool. yeah. Of course, then you know, like that's my. We need to talk about composting, of course, because uh, that's my background. That's the majority of my work is always in, uh, involved in composting, but. I wanted to just like um, showcase a little bit of how we actually approached composting on these projects. Uh, we had a very small crew, you know, we didn't uh, had a big, big uh, team of people working on these projects. Um, and that meant that uh, using Nuke Studio as our hub of visual effects supervision really worked out really well because I literally had the edit, not only with the renders like we usually have, but I could actually jump into the scripts immediately. You know, I could double click, version up, go into the script, change a few things, go back, go to another shot, change another thing. And it really helped me to even copy pasting setups. You know, I could easily copy elements from one shot to the other. Or if, and for example, on the case of Just Cause, Just Cause was such an experimental look because it had such a graphical look with a lot of motion graphics, a lot of elements. Nuke Studio really helped me choosing the clips, playing back them, trimming them, looking which clip would work best, and I could just easily bring them into the node graph and just test them on top of the shot, you know? Mm. So it kind of, in a way, for me, lately, compositing, um, you know, like 3D compositing and grading is all kind of like merging together, you know? It's all kind of like becoming much more closer because, uh, and that's why I, I, I did it all in the same app, you know? Where I had the edit, I could do the comp and then I could do the grade. We're gonna talk about that later, but. But and of course, and then, and then using uh, what Nuke is really good at, using the position pass to place all these 2D yep. elements, uh, using the multi-pass EXRs to make sure that we can actually continue the work that the shader people have done in 3D. So every, every lighting artist, they've come up with a shader and they've come up with the texturing and they come up with certain lighting aspects of the shot. We're continuing their work by rebuilding the shader inside of Nuke and really making sure that we don't have to actually re-render all the time mm -hmm. and we can do changes on the fly. Uh, for immediate feedback with the client. Yep. Um, it's all about that and, and using the robust 3D system of Nuke to build really massive matte paintings using 3D cards. And it was really, really interesting, really cool uh, to, I think it was like, this was like the first, these two projects were the first projects I've done using Nuke Studio on this pipeline because I've been using Hero and Nuke for years mm -hmm. at the mill. You know, using the editing Hero and then having Nuke at the same time open and then bouncing between the two applications. But having them as one application really changed the workflow. It became everything much more organic and much more yeah, creative. More interactive. Really. And exactly. Yeah. Also because you were getting the scripts from <coughs> your other artists, yeah. were, which were actually not with you, but you were just downloading the yeah. the file and yeah. not even the renders. So yeah, absolutely. So we, we never, you know, it's all through the cloud. So every time an artist would comp something, of course, we had a naming convention. I had a, I had a strict naming convention that they had to follow. And so when they save something, it would show up on my folder, on my folder structure. So Nuke Studio, once, uh, once I do version up, it would just find it. And then they don't have to render it because I, I don't want to have to have them render the shot, upload it, and then I have to download it. We're talking about gigs and gigs of EXRs. Yeah. It's much easier that just to bring in the, the, the script itself. They can have a render themselves because they're testing it and they're looking at it. But they give me the script, and I can render it inside Nuke Studio. And I can I, I used it many times using the background rendering capability, where you can actually put a bunch of shots yeah, rendering at the same the time. Server. Uh, yeah. You know, like the uh, uh, using all the cores of the machine and really getting uh, the machine to be used fully. Uh, that was very interesting and mm -hmm. a very brand new way of working, really, uh, which was great. So um, yeah, and I'm gonna I'm gonna have a really <laughs> short mention on scripting as well, like um, you know. Like I said, I'm a sucker for for optimization. So 
I found that every time we comped these shots, all the, sh the, the renders were all done in V-Ray. So mm -hmm. they were all the same shaders. Everything yeah. was the same. Everything had the same name. So we figured we would do a Python script to automatically build the shader. So we basically did that. So this script that you're watching now on the stream basically is an automated process <coughs> where it picks up the renders from a specific folder. So like if you're on shot 10, it would pick up the renders from shot 10. And then it basically builds the base structure for all the shader we build. It also builds the position pass with the correct camera for that shot. And then also builds like little sections of motion blur, depth, and, um, and color correction. So that all my artists would work on similar way so that everyone that would open the script, they knew what was going on. And also making this much faster because building this entire script would take hours. And now it takes seconds. You click and it's a gizmo and it's done. And then when you get that back as well from your artist, you actually know where they have put the stuff. Yeah, around. exactly. So and and when they when they do something wrong, I can tell them, ah, you, what are you done here? Like this is <laughs> not this is not where you should put the gizmo. So I, then I, I then of course go into my uh, optimization of their script by deleting it. <laughs> and so <laughs> I usually tell that to my to my <laughs> to my colleagues, like I'm going to optimize your script. Delete. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then of course I also had a switch uh, that was also pretty cool. I had switches on the script where you know when you're working interactively, the scripts go quite slowly. So then you can switch off all the blurs, switch off all the grade notes, switch off all the vector blurs in one go. You had a button, and all the vector blurs would switch off. So that became quite fast and became quite um, quite handy for this production specifically. And then yeah. to a versioning system, which yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, like, again, especially for the Just Cause project, um, versioning is really changing the way that I'm presenting to clients uh, because, um, you know, you guys all know if we follow the same naming convention, it's really easy to version up inside mm -hmm. of Nuke Studio. And it, it became such an organic way because you can just jump and do so many variants to your client. You know, you can show the client, okay, uh, here's a red version, here's a blue version, here's a, here's a darker version, here's with more snow, with less snow. And you can just jump from version to version to version. This started happening last year when I was at the mill on, on, on the Nuke Studio suite that we had. It was really interesting because we, the clients for the first time, they would have access to all these versions. And mm. it's the first time they are watching all the shot progressing. Mm. And it's quite funny because a lot of my clients would turn to me and say, ah, oh, now I understand what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, you've placed that there. Oh, that's a good idea. That's cool. <laughs> so they felt much more engaged. Yeah. And a lot of times they would have suggestions like, oh, can you put some fire? Oh, you've done it already. I see you've dropped it because it didn't look good. So it's really <laughs> cool that you can be so interactive and so mm. fast changing versions. And, and that meant that instead of, uh, you know, I'm all, all for having everything in the same place. I've always been like that. And you have your edit, and if your client has a suggestion saying, okay, can those two shots be bluer? You can just version to that version, or you can use a soft effect and change it slightly, and then you send it off immediately to the client, and, and they get that instant feedback. It's much faster, you know? Mm. So I, I found that really, really cool to work that way. Yeah. On well, final integrating. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I find this really cool because obviously, in your previous works and everything, we have always gone to another system to do the grading and yeah. have someone specific for it. Um, and I've been talking with a lot of people how you could actually grade in Nuke Studio. Yeah. Uh, but I, what you have done, I think, is really cool on how you actually ended up creating smaller scripts and doing this. So you ended up doing all the grading yourself. <coughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've always, you know, I'm not saying, you know, a colorist is an amazing uh, role in a production and they contribute an amazing deal to projects. But when I'm doing a full CG project, I, I feel quite gutted when I hand over a render, a, a script, a, a shot that has been done, and I give the grade or the colorist an EXR with a mat. That's it. Like, I, I'm kind of like, uh, you know, you could, you could have IDs, you could have depth passes, you could have masks, you could have so many things. So I, I feel like inside of Nuke, because I have access to all the, the reflections and all the specular passes and all the depth passes and all the masks and everything that a CG pipeline can provide me, I have so much control in doing grading. So I kind of don't really do a grading session. I, I kind of keep grading it. That's the thing. Like, I know I've separated the slide here, 
but mm -hmm. that's how we usually tend to control these projects. As we comp it, we actually keep grading them and changing them because we have total control. And then at the end, we have some finessing mm -hmm. to do, and that's where it comes really on handy using soft effects to actually do a bit of grading on top. And a lot of times also doing simple, simple comps where I start with EXR and I then put some grade nodes, and if I need a mask, I can bring the mask because I have the script because, there. Yeah. I can copy paste the script. I'm all inside the same application. So, in a way, I, I you know, I, I kind of really enjoy grading. And of course, you know, I'm not saying that you should always grade in Nuke. Probably not, because a lot of compositors are not going to be good graders. They're not going to be good colorists. Yeah. But you know, my background comes <coughs> from these kind of things. Like mm. I'm, I'm, I'm. I've always been very involved artistically on my productions, and, if I, and I've always graded my productions when I used to work on smaller studios. Mm. So for me, this is natural, you know, like to control the edit and control the grade, yeah. uh, not just doing the comp. So I think this was just an extension. And I think, to be honest, like not saying anything bad about third party colorist uh, applications, but Nuke does have all the tools you need to do grading. I mean, it does. You have the color correctors, you have the grade nodes, you have you can do secondary grading with masks, you can do keying. It probably even has better tools than a grading tool because there there's all the tools. You have everything. Mm -hmm. You know, you can mask, you can track, you can do all you these can things. You can do separately, you can Exactly. So thing. so yeah. you just have to get used to it. You know, it's all about it's all about artistic uh, uh, freedom and it's all about like artistic look. You you have of course to have a look, you know. And then the tool set is not as important, you know. I, I find it really fascinating that I can stay on the same application uh, because it gives me more control. But that's because I'm a control freak. I, I love to control <laughs> everything. Uh, you know, a lot optimize, of people... No, optimize, optimize everything. Optimize. Exactly. No, no one has noticed it. A lot yet. of people don't <laughs> like that. A lot of people don't like that. You know, I know they, they like to give it away and someone else's problem. But I, I'm not like that. I, I like to be there until the very end. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's my fault. That's my problem. Uh, you know, I just have to live with that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so so that's pretty much uh, how we did the grading, and um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Cool. This presentation. That's awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Igor. Thank you. <laughs> so I, before before uh, we we jump into the Q and I, I just wanted to like really thank you so much, and also s tell you guys if you want, can visit my website. Um, at Hugo, uh, Colin Guerra com, and you can watch the breakdowns of these productions that you saw here. We've done some really cool breakdowns at Fire Without Smoke for you guys to watch. Also, if you want, go and check out the work that we do at Fire Without Smoke. Uh, we're doing really good work uh, for the gaming industry lately. And of course, sign up for my Nuke Studio uh, training course at FX <laughs> PhD. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I Please love do it. that. And follow me on Twitter if yeah, you want to watch a lot of crazy follow things him. and, and <laughs> see a lot of weird <laughs> shit that I sometimes <laughs> uh, <laughs> check out. So do all those things. So thank you so much, guys. Oh, thank you, guys. <laughs>